NASCAR, they do a little bit of kind of piracy on the way there, but that's that's their kind of their their, their main goal. Now, the context of all this is at this point, um, India is arguably the wealthiest country in the world. It's run by a kind of despotic, the last great Mughal empire emperor, uh, Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb is probably the wealthiest person in the world. Um, and he started to do this very lucrative business, um, trading largely kind of calico and chintz, these beautiful fabrics that were made in India, um, back to England through this new multinational corporation, the East India Company, that's just been around for about 70 uh, or 80 years. And the East India Company is making this vast fortune importing these fabrics, which have become incredibly popular in England. Um, and so their fate is very much tied uh, to the good grace, being in the good graces of this emperor in, um, in India, Aurangzeb. And so that's kind of the context, basically. And Aurangzeb has sent off this treasure fleet um, of ships to go to Mecca um, and where they do a bunch of trading as well as the kind of like religious ceremonies there. And then they're coming back uh, to, to sail back to India in these treasure ships. And that's where they get intercepted by the pirates. Huh. Okay. So uh, just uh, one little bit of global trade here. I'm always interested in this. Mecca is for Muslim religious pilgrimage. Uh, presumably those coming from India that lived close to ports would sail along the southern route, stop there, come back. For the trade of these materials that the East India Company would do, once they took them from India, stopped at the port of Mecca, would they then continue around the Horn of Africa or would they then trade with traders in Egypt or elsewhere who would then move their goods overland through Europe and eventually to England or would they trade in both directions by land or by sea? I think it was both actually, but we should just make it clear that the, the goods that the pirates are after you know, are not the East India Company goods, right? The, this is the this is all of Aurangzeb's the Indian uh, uh, goods, right? So the East India Company is trading in what we now call the Middle East, but they're also then taking their goods all the way back by sea around the Horn of Africa back to um, back to London, where they would sell them. So there's kind of there's trade kind of going in all all different directions. the The problem is that the British at this point have this reputation for being uh, what they were called, you know, a, a, a nation of pirates, right? And so, you know, they're, they're trying, there are all these people working for the East India Company who are just trying to do proper trade, right? They've figured out this incredibly lucrative system where they get this fabrics and they buy them and then they sell them for this incredible markup back in, in London. And they're just making, you know, immense amount of money. And the other thing about the East India Company that we should note that makes them historically important is that they're, they're the first joint stock company, so the first case where what we would now call a public company, where there are there are shares that are publicly traded in the company, and so for the first time, people are making money not just by selling something and you know having a profit margin on it, but they're making money by investing in shares in a company, which then go up or down. Um, and so people have made all this paper money um, from investing in these publicly traded shares in the East India Company, and so any potential threat to the East India Company and their dealings with India at this point has enormous kind of economic consequences for England and its entire kind of global emerging capitalist system that they're kind of inventing uh, at that particular moment in time. So that's a big part of the context as well. All right. It looks like our friend Henry is going to upset all sorts of apple carts, upsetting the most powerful nation or the wealthiest nation on earth and one of the biggest companies in England at the time. So with his attack on the Indian ship, what first of all, how does that go down? And then what's the immediate aftermath of that? Every ends up kind of ganging up with a couple of other pirate ships that have gathered at this exact same point at the mouth of the Red Sea. And they set sail. They almost lose. They almost kind of blow it when the treasure fleet comes by in the middle of the night and they kind of miss them somehow, which is extraordinary. But then they set off in chase of them. And in part because the fancy is so fast, it's able to catch up with the main kind of flagship, which is this enormous vessel. And it's a really interesting set of coincidences basically happen, which is actually right at the beginning of the book, which is every and, and the fancy should not have won this encounter. They were massively outmanned. You know, there were far more cannon on the, on the Indian treasure ship. Um, 
which which had this great name. That the, the ship was literally called. The translation of it was "exceeding treasure" or "excessive <laughs> treasure." Right? I mean, it, you can't get more obvious in the branding <laughs> than, than calling the, the ship. I mean, if, if you're trying to attract a bunch of pirates, like that's that's not that's a that's a pretty good way to do it. So, uh, every probably you know should not have. Uh, won this encounter, but basically two things happen in, in the space of a couple of minutes. Um, the first is uh, a cannon on board the exceeding treasure uh, explodes, um, which could sometimes happen with cannons if they were either improperly manufactured or if they were poorly maintained. And an exploding cannon is is like a a, a bomb, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's an incredibly dangerous thing. So people are right. Or the, the cannon crew right around it are just like, literally, you know, their, um, their bodies are kind of dismembered by this. Uh, and it sets fire. So 10 or 20 people are, you know, mortally injured or seriously injured and it sets fire to the, to the deck of the ship. Um, so just as they're kind of starting to kind of, you know, fire on the pirate ship this bomb basically goes off on the on the side of the indian ship and then every gets this incredibly lucky break where one of their initial cannon shots hits the main mast of the indian ship and splits it in half which is like a one in a hundred shot um and so those two things happen simultaneously and they give you know what is effectively the underdog in the fight this the sudden advantage. And so every is able to kind of his men um, board the ship and they take control of the ship. It turns out um, that there are uh, unusual uh, for, for most maritime activity uh, during this period, there are uh, a, a remarkable number of women on board the ship who have made their pilgrimage to Mecca. They're there as like religious pilgrims. And so we don't know the exact details of it, but some, uh, kind of terrible, uh, set of, uh, you know, kind of sexual attacks happen, rapes happen, uh, on board the ship, not by every himself, but by his men. And one of the passengers on the ship is rumored to have been Aurangzeb, the, the grand Mughal of India, his granddaughter or some kind of direct relation to his. Um, and we don't really know that much about who this woman was. There's disputes about how directly she was related to Aurangzeb and, and, and all that. But the, the existence of this uh, woman who was in some way potentially violated by these pirates um, becomes central to the story uh, over the, over the coming months and, and years. But in the end, they, they ultimately make out with the equivalent of something like $200 million worth of um, bounty. I mean, it's, it's arguably one of the largest heists in the history of crime, depending on how you value it. Um, and it's, a, it's an extraordinary, um, it, it's an extraordinary heist with terrifying and, you know, incredibly offensive sexual violence bound up in it. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Yeah, if I were Great Britain, I would be mortified right now because the wealthiest nation on earth, we've personally insulted them if she was, in fact, the granddaughter of the Mughal emperor. And then they need to launch a manhunt, as your book indicates. So it's dangerous enough just to be able to reach your end destination around the world. And now you have to do this, but you have to find one particular person who could probably resourcefully disappear in any number of ports. So how do you do that? Yeah, that's the thing that originally actually got me into this story. And then I realized there were so many other kind of layers to it. Because again, you know, we talked about the connection to terrorism before. It, it's in, in a real sense, uh, every becomes a kind of Bin Laden-like figure um, in, in, in two ways, really. And the first is that with a small band of, you know, comrades, he triggers a truly global crisis, right? Um, Aurangzeb is so offended uh, by the the stolen goods and by the attacks on his relative and and other people in his extended court, um, that he threatens to expel the East India Company from India, which would just have devastating consequences for them financially. Um, they they basically put um, 
the East India Company uh, employees, both in Bombay and at Surat, another kind of ma major hub for them, under house arrest while they try and decide what to do. There's some question about like whether they're actually just going to get executed or a mob is going to run them over. And it's un totally unclear whether the East India Company is going to continue doing business there. Um, and so you've got this massive kind of global crisis. It's been triggered by the actions of like a hundred men on a, on a single ship, basically. So it's, it, it's similar in a sense to the, the kind of global crisis that happened with 9-11, where you have a very small number of people who are able to create these massive powers and get them, you know, kind of, uh, you know, in conflict with each other. And then the other side of it is that once this happens, he does become the world's most wanted man. And there's a kind of a global manhunt uh, out to, to get him. It's basically the British decide, okay, here's the deal. Like we, we need to make a clear public statement, both in terms of the East India Company and in terms of the, the crown, that we are not a nation of pirates and that we will not tolerate this. And basically the East India Company has to go back to the authorities in London and say, listen, we need to take a stand against piracy. Like, we, you know, we're going to go out of business and this is going to be catastrophic. We're going to lose our foothold in India. And so they basically announced this global manhunt for Henry Every and there's multiple kind of rewards uh, put on this, you know, it's for whoever kind of finds him or any of his mates. Um, and they dispatch notices all around the kind of growing British empire, you know, we're looking for this, for this person. Um, and so it's, re it's really like the first global manhunt in the, in the history of the world. And it was hard to do back in the day. You know, you couldn't just put a bulletin up on the internet and have people look out for this guy. You, you know, it took time basically to get the word out there. And the time was crucial for every and his crew. How did the manhunt go? Were they able to make any headway or did every disappear? I can't tell you the ending of the book. <laughs> <laughs> as much as you're willing to I tease, will say. You know? <laughs> so amazingly, every decides to basically, they, they briefly stop over in reunion near Madagascar and a bunch of the crew kind of get off the ship and say, okay, we're, we're done. But he then decides to sail basically without stopping. He knows if he goes to any port, he might be recognized. He's not getting like updates about what's happening in the news, right? He's like <laughs> isolated. He has no way of like just checking in on CNN to see if the authorities are after him, right? So, but he assumes that he's probably, you know, become the most wanted man in the world. And so he basically, he convinces most of his crew to sail all the way back to the Bahamas, to Nassau, basically. Um, and because uh, he thinks he will probably get safe harbor there, Um and because it's kind of a crooked governor there who probably will receive him. And so he, he basically sails from kind of the far side of Madagascar all, all the way to the Bahamas w without stopping in any ports along the way, which is, you think about doing that in 1695, that's pretty crazy. Um, uh, and then eventually, uh, I'll say a little bit about this without giving away too much of it. Um, uh, some of his crew is captured. And one of the things that was so great about this book in terms of writing it is that they're, they're brought to court um, in London and it is effectively a show trial, right? They're trying to like, they're putting these pirates who are associated with every um, on trial, accusing them of these terrible crimes. And they, they want to one, you know, win the case against them and execute them and make that a public statement that England is opposed to piracy. Um, and so because of that, they hire a printer um, to publish a full transcript of the trial and uh, so that they can release it to the world as this kind of public statement that shows that the crown is opposed to this. And, and there's, you know, the, the, the actual kind of uh, prosecution and judges involved in this are the the highest kind of upper echelon uh, 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 of the legal kind of apparatus in England at the period. And so it's a little bit like in terms of the focus on it and the people involved, it was as though the OJ trial were being heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> That's how I can describe <laughs> it, right? It's like everybody's obsessed with this trial and they brought in all the most prestigious figures in the entire British government to be part of it. And they've hired people to keep this transcript of it. And uh, initially it actually completely backfires because 
pirates at this point have become these folk heroes for precisely the reasons we talked about earlier, right? They're the people who are, you know, the kind of working class heroes. They're the people who have the most egalitarian economic systems. And yeah, they've committed these offenses against, you know, these women on, on an Indian ship. But, you know, this is a period of time where there's a lot of nationalism and racism and so on. And so people, you know, the, the ordinary jury doesn't really care so much about, you know, some people on the other half of the world. They care 